Boom. Welcome back to the Contacts Coaching Podcast. We're here today with Matt McLeod, director at PGC Basketball, owner of CoachMcLeod.com, and how should we say this one? Partner collaborator with Tyler Costin and Savvy Consulting. Coach, thanks for finally jumping on. Absolutely, man. I'm excited to be here. Glad it, uh, our schedule aligned and we got to do this today. Finally, right? Right in the end, end part of basketball season. So if you don't mind, take us through your background here. How'd you get into this space? Love for the audience to get a feel for uh, who you are, what you do, where you're from, et cetera. And then we'll go from there. Love it. Yeah. You know, I was a, a high school coach for, for 14 years and really enjoyed it. I uh, spent the first 10 seasons in Texas before the last four in Oklahoma. A uh, couple of years ago, uh, stopped coaching at the high school level. Now, uh, more focusing on doing what I do now, which is just helping uh, individual teams, individual coaches and players, uh, whether it be, you know, consulting, breaking down film, watching practices, doing a little one-on-one -on -one coaching throughout the week, helping with the college recruiting process. Like it's it's all over the place. But, um, you know, I, I mentioned to you right before we started recording that I grew up in North Carolina. And uh, even though I coached in Texas for a long time, like what football is in Texas and states like that is what basketball is in North Carolina. And so growing up 5'11", below average athlete, like much better at other sports, basketball is my love. And so even though I'm not currently coaching a team, I just couldn't get away from the game. Just looking for other ways now to serve and to give back to the, the amazing basketball community. Can you do me a favor and go a little bit more in depth on where your journey went from being 5'11 guy trying to get in the game and how you got your start collegiately and found your way into high school athletics before finally yeah. pivoting in the last two years into more of a consulting space? Yeah, for sure. You know, again, grew up just playing every sport, but definitely loving basketball the most. And grew up in North Carolina, there's, you know, was one summer where I had either four or five future NBA players on the team. Um, obviously, I was not one of them, but played with some incredible players. Uh, the, the Tracy, I'm not Tracy McGrady, but uh, the uh, Corey McGettys of the world, guys like that, that just that, you know, we've seen and play at, at high level division one and NBA. And just said, I was that athlete just because I was on their team. I thought, oh, yeah, I can do that, too. Right. Those are my guys I can play. And um, going in uh, early in my senior year uh, during football season, uh, we were the number one ranked team in the state. Um, and I know you know how this goes, Justin, as a coach. I was that athlete that um, even though I would played lots of great positions and was a high level football player, I never played running back. And so senior night finally convinced or my coach to let me play running back. Uh, my final stat line for that night was one carry for 18 yards and a left ankle that had every tendon and ligament snapped except for my Achilles. It was like uh, that old Rice Krispie snack crackle pop is what it sounded like. And uh, you know what I learned at that point, because I, I was being recruited in multiple sports, had offers in multiple sports. But what I learned at that moment in time was there are thousands, probably tens of thousands of other high school athletes just like me. Because the moment I got hurt and it was going to be about a 12 month rehab process that all those coaches that were, again, this is old school, sending me letters in the mail, calling me on Wednesday nights on the phone, like the phone didn't ring as much and the mailbox wasn't as full when I'd go check after school. And so, uh, you know, uh, just that was a lot of soul searching for me, uh, decided not to have surgery, but to uh, try to rehab and play the rest of my senior year. And so then, you know, went to college with, without any opportunities. And so I actually ended up at Oral Roberts university in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where, uh, finally after about a year and a half, got back to full strength, um, ended up being a manager for the men's team and actually playing on the scout team for the women. So that was my college experience. <laughs> um, and so I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it was different from what I thought, but you know, it, it was a great time. And, uh, just that's where in college, my love for the game continued, uh, actually started working in division one athletics after that, but more on the, the marketing side, the, the multimedia side of that, um, there at ORU and, um, but just something inside me said, man, I want to coach. <laughs> I want to impact players in the game at a different level. Um, I'm sure Justin, similar with your growing up experience, like there were certain coaches that I loved playing for and really changed my life. Um, and there were certain coaches that I wanted athletes to have a different experience than I had <laughs> with that coach. And, uh, you know, uh, my wife and I, we were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the time. And we were talking, I think it was, you know, middle of October, um, you know, I guess at the end of the school year, my wife's a teacher, like we'll move back to North Carolina where I'm from. 
maybe my high school coach will give me a job. We'll figure something out. Um, and lo and behold, about two weeks after that conversation, I got a phone call from a school down in South Texas uh, where their athletic director had literally just walked out the door in the middle of the school year. And it was one of those uh, friend of a friend type of conversations. They had offered the job to uh, my best friend, um, but he was about to go to Australia to play pro golf. And so they gave me a call. And so, I don't, man, I still don't know what they were thinking. But at 25 years old, I became an athletic director and a varsity basketball coach at a high school in Texas. And so, uh, yeah, had 10 great years in Texas, uh, came up to Oklahoma, and we've just been here ever since. Thank you for the elaboration, because you just gave me about 16 different things I want to talk to. <laughs> and I'm trying to process the order of operations here to best serve. And I think where I want to start is 25 years old. New AD, new head coach. Preparation being a manager at the college level, which people that are listening don't sleep on that experience. That's where I got my start. Mm. Doing that job is a, a training into all things, how to run an operation. Um, but let's, even with that, what is it when you arrived at Faith Academy in South Texas in January, middle of the year, mind yeah. you, Billy here. Uh, that you realized right away that you needed to figure out both as the athletic director and as a coach. What are the things that you would say through your experience that caught you by surprise that you would now offer to others as you need to take care of ABC or you're going to yeah. That's a great question. And, you know, I had, I had a great experience as a college manager, Scott Sutton was the head coach at OU time. And he had just gotten the job like a year before I got there. And he, at the time, was the youngest D1 coach. Um, I think he was 26, 27 when he got the, the head coaching job. And the staff was full of amazing coaches. Uh, Tom Hankins, longtime D2 head coach. He's now coaching in the G League for the Mad Ants in Fort Wayne. Uh, Corey Williams, who played with Michael Jordan for the Bulls, won a world championship, has been a D1 head coach. And so, like, man, at the time, I had no idea how much I was actually gleaming and gaining from those guys. Um, but what made it even more interesting when I moved down to Victoria, Texas for that job was I wasn't going to be the basketball coach until the next season. Um, the current coach who was actually, um, I'm sure you've run the same experiences. I know you've been in high school athletics for a long time. He was actually basically a 19 year old kid. Um, the head coach they had left as the season, season was starting. And so they had a this 19 year old that was a great high school player in his own right. Um, Could have gone and played college, stayed home. Um, but man, so I walked in, in in January. I'll never forget the the first conversation I had with a parent was to tell her that her son, who was a, a role player on the varsity team, was actually ineligible to play. Um, the school had been wrong. As I was, you know, because what I did is I got there and uh, Taps is the name of the organization in Texas, the private school league. I just started reading that that handbook. Like I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, well, I'll just read, <laughs> right? Kind of like when I'm trying to put together my kid's bed as their Christmas present or whatever. It's like, I'm just reading the manual, trying to figure out what to do. And man, that conversation where I was just walking in being factual. Hey man, just want to let you know, sorry, your son can't play. Without ever actually thinking about the other side of the table and how I was coming across. And I, I mean, I was just killing her son's dreams, right? Like he, she had been told he was eligible. I'm telling her he's not eligible. Um, and so what I learned from that was just, man, you got to consider the other side. Um, and even later on in my coaching career, I had a mentor who really opened my eyes. And um, it's not even that, like, I think a lot of times as coaches, athletic directors, you know, whatever role we play, we see ourselves sitting like across. I mean, we're probably physically sitting across the table from a parent, but we all see this adversarial relationship. And what was really highlighted there and what my mentor opened my eyes to even more later was, no, like we're sitting on the same side of the table. We want what's best for Johnny or for Sally, whoever it is. We just might have a different viewpoint of what's best or how we have to handle the situation. And so all of a sudden, like, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about like, you know, what would you tell your, your younger self? Like, I would tell him like, look, look through it through their lens first, before you ever have the conversation, before you ever walk into that room, whether it's a parent meeting, good news, bad news, whatever it is, like look through their side um, and be prepared for that side and, and under help them understand that, Hey, we're walking through this thing together. Um, you know, it wasn't like I wanted him to be ineligible. I wanted the team to be successful. They could that season. Uh, but just that for me that first conversation, uh, Luckily, we had a great relationship later on. We laugh about that conversation as we're still in, in communication now, almost 20 years later. But um, man, just walking in and, and not realizing what I didn't know um, 
you know, again, ne had never been an assistant coach, had never even worked in, in athletics before I was an athletic director um, on that side of the table. And so there were so many things that uh, about 12 to 14 months later, I was like, ah, wish I could have a redo. Um, but man, what a great learning environment. So if you did have a redo, mm -hmm. what are some of those things you could offer our listeners who may be new to the job mm -hmm. so that they can focus on it in addition to try to put yourself in the seat of the person that you are working with, right? Yeah. Try to see both, uh, as it was described to me, once you want to be on the dance floor and in the balcony at the same time, mm -hmm. observing the interaction. What what else right. could you offer if you had a do-over? Hey, these are some things you want to be attentive to in addition to trying to understand the, the point of view of the other person. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I'd say for me personally, the number one thing would be like, not only don't be afraid to ask for help or ask for advice, like seek it out. Um, I think a lot of times as a, as a younger coach or even inexperienced coach, we don't want to let down this guard that we don't know everything. Um, and it's easy to do, right? Like no judgment. There's actually a local high school coach um, that I was connected with. It's his first year as a head coach. Again, comes from a great background, but assistant coach on some good teams. And um, But he was really hesitant uh, to let me help him out because – I could just tell he wanted, you know, I'm the head coach, I'm doing this. And hey, that's great. Been there. You'll learn just like I did. Um, but for me, it didn't change until about year three, when I recognized like, find people around me that have been doing it longer, that have been successful at it, that I can learn from their processes. Not that I'm not gonna make mistakes, because I think making mistakes is a valuable way for all of us to learn. But just like, I, I've never got to start picking up the phone. Um, again, Texas football, uh, you know, I don't know if you ever watched the movie or the TV show Friday Night Lights, right? But like I read the book, I was all in. I loved that back then. And one thing I realized was, okay, these same football programs are great year after year, right? Players change, come and go, but they're always good. And so I literally started just calling high school football teams in West Texas <laughs> and just called said, hey, coach, what do you do? Like I'm a basketball coach. I, I'm not a threat to you, you know, to challenge you for titles. Like, what do you guys do that are different? And it, it was amazing to be Justin. Like, without exception, the answer was, well, the same thing we do with our varsity team, we do with our JV team, our freshman team, our middle school teams, even our, our first and second grade Pop Warner teams. Now, it might not be the exact same plays and it might not be the exact, you know, the same intricacies and formations and things, but our verbiage is the same. So a shared language. Um, you know, the, the, the mindset and approach, are we a running team? Are we a more of a pro style offense, whatever they were? And he's like, so when these guys get to high school, nothing's new for them, right? Like we're just layering on top of, um, and so that's what I started to do. I actually literally started to call. I, like I looked in at the, uh, the playoff bracket from the year before any coach that went to the final four, I just called and said, Hey coach, <laughs> new guy, you don't know me. Um, what can I learn from you? And actually what was really, really interesting to me is how open they were to share like and I, I see it now as an older coach and I'm sure you're shaking your head you too like like let I would love to share experiences with other coaches and help them learn like I, I don't feel threatened by it um I, I would love to see that because I, I want to see our game continue to grow and have great coaches in the ranks um and here's why I'd encourage anyone watching this it doesn't matter if you're year one or year 14 of coaching um to do that because one of those random out of the blue phone calls um his name was Scott Vaughn. He was a, a high school coach in the Dallas area that was super successful. Um, he is still to this day one of my best friends, and he's actually on staff for the Golden State Warriors. And so, like, it's amazing now, um, even if you're just selfish, like, you never know the connections you're going to get. Um, and just having that relationship with him has allowed me to be around pro teams and pro coaches, high-level players, to see what are they doing? You know, what can I steal for the high school level or with these college teams that I'm working with now? And so, yeah, that's, that's one thing, like, not only don't hesitate to ask, like seek it out. Um, that would be a big, big thing that I would recommend anyone to do. That's great advice. And I have, <clears throat> uh, again, I have a couple different threads I want to go on. And I'm trying to keep tabs on all of this. So the first one is, is let's try to keep concise because like you said, eventually you'll get there. But what advice do you have for people that are in that space where, they aren't seeking help, even though the resources are available, maybe even in the same building. Yeah. Because of insecurity, uh, fear, um, not realizing the help is there. But how do you get them to the other side quicker, where you and I, as older guys, are very much 
how do I surround myself with people smarter than me so I can like just yeah. tap into them and facilitate? Um, how do we help young in the profession, not age-wise people yeah, yeah. Who, may, who may be having a little imposter syndrome, just be like, it's okay. Like just yeah. get help. Yeah. I, I say two things. Number one, like social media can be a great tool um, of sliding to somebody's DMs. I'm replying to somebody's tweet. Uh, man, I love it when I get those DMs and those responses to mine, just, you know, how I might be able to help or share. And I mean, I think you alluded to it. The second thing would be who else is in your building, right? Okay. Maybe it's not a basketball coach, um, but there are so many things that we go through this, the ball, the size of the ball might change or whether you can use your hands or your feet might be the difference, but there's got to be a, a tenured long time coach experience wise in that building. Uh, for me, there are two coaches that have been so influential on my journey. One was our head football coach at one school I was coaching at. And another was the head wrestling coach at a school I was coaching at. And they were so influential because they'd been around the block and they could share insights and knowledge, especially anyone who's young in the profession, like as you change schools, so much of expectations and cultures and interactions and things change. Like I learned early on, you can, I just can't take what I did at one school and think it'll immediately translate to the new school um, as far as how I want to implement our program. And so, man, who are those people on campus that have been around long enough to help me get better? No, I love that. And I appreciate that as well, because I think that's one of the hardest things when you start is feeling as if, you got to prove your worth. I mean, I had a conversation with one of my former advisees and players who's mid twenties going back to help coach lacrosse because she loves the game and it was important to her. And it's like, basically asked me, how do you get over imposter syndrome? I said, don't worry about it. Just go put the kids first, build relationship. Yeah. Like all that'll work itself out, you know, and, but it's hard, right. To your point. And so I think your, approach and this is going to bring us back of calling all of the texas west texas football coaches knowing that history and i'm not a threat to your program what do you do that is different that makes you successful is a great question and it is open-ended so you can take whatever you want from it and so what i want to go with on that is is twofold number one in your own coaching career, right? If we look at your 14 seasons, uh, what do you do that is different that makes you successful? Number two, and we're going to come back to this. I'm just priming you. Uh, I'm real bullish in my second evolution as a coach of being a seasonal coach and having seasonal athletes. And mm -hmm. I am anti youth sports industrial complex. Let's everyone should be a specialist. And so um, because you've referenced football, you've referenced wrestling, mm -hmm. what are some things that you've stolen mm -hmm. in those conversations that may be conceptual and hell, they might be tactical mm -hmm. that you have Im implemented and in your consulting career that you have shared with basketball coaches. Hey, I saw the tennis coach do this the other day and you really should consider this. So yeah. lots of space to run there, coach. Yeah, oh, I love it. I think one thing that always made me different was I'm not afraid to try stuff out. Like I'm a, I'm a mad scientist, you know, like uh, if you're familiar with the system in Grinnell, the D3 level, what they run, like if that's a hundred percent offensive crazy, I'm like mm, natural habitat, probably about 92% of that. Um, but unfortunately there were years where I was probably only 75% of that because I hesitated. Um, and I think as coaches, it's, it's a lot easier for us to lose doing what's expected versus trying to win or help our team be more successful with something that might not be the norm. You know, like, you know, one example of that for me was, I always heard like, okay, attack when you have numbers in transition, attack when you have numbers in transition, but attack when you don't have numbers. That was my, one of my first things, right? I was like, no, like, do we have an advantage? You know, I ask athletes all the time, uh, especially when I'm directing with PGC, like what's the easiest defense to score against? And so I get man zone, da, 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 da. no, disorganized a disorganized defense and so that was one thing from early on like uh, you know and I also knew for us like it, down in South Texas you know we were the city itself was about 70 percent Hispanic and so you know just from a like looking at my team organization we weren't going to run the rebounding battle <laughs> you know like we weren't going to have this dominant post player that we were just going to run stuff for um and so we just started playing really fast uh, we won our first district game that year, 90 to 88. And it was so much fun. Um, and it was just different. 
Um, and that's one of those things where, you know, you, you can't be afraid to be out of the box a little bit. Um, you know, for me, another thing as I was a coach was like, what's my why? Um, I had a couple of mentors open my eyes to that that I shared with other coaches. Um, like for an example, I had a, a mentor come watch me first eight minutes of every practice was three man weave with different finishes. The first two minutes, were one finish, the next two minutes, you know, right. And we're, we're keeping track and we're, we're competing like lots of great pieces within the drill. Um, but after practice was done, <laughs> this mentor's name was Bill. Bill said, so Matt, why do you run three man weave? I'm like, well, you know, Bill, we want to be a transition team. We want to be in great shape. He's like, okay, well, there are a lot of drills for that. Why three man weave? I'm like, well, we get multiple finishes. And again, he's like, yeah, multiple drills you do that. Like why three? And like, it was like three or four minutes. He just kept saying, no, no, but why that? And I really had to stop and think. And my answer was, because my high school coach ran three man weave every day in practice. And so that's another thing. We have to be okay to be different <laughs> than others. Um, you know, be different by being different. Uh, and so, you know, for me, it's like, okay, wait a minute. What actually leads to success, right? Like, because he asked me, he's like, Matt, tell me, in your transition offense, in the middle of a game, if, you know, someone has the ball in the wing, they throw the ball in the middle of the floor, like, what are you going to do if they immediately run behind that person with the ball? I'm like, no, like, you're bringing your defender with them, space, get to the corner. Like, I was an early adapter to all those pieces. He's like, okay, well, then why doing three-man weave? <laughs> I was like, oh. And so, you know, his coach is like, another thing that I know is different, which sounds silly to me now, but I think I've done so long is, like, let your practices look like your games, right? I think a lot of times there's a disconnect, right? Like, why aren't we ready? We don't do, we like, no, like, what does your practice look like? Um, what, are, what are you doing in practice to make it as real and actually harder than a real game, but replicating those scenarios? Um, that's why I said where I was different. Like, it's okay. Like, we're going to shoot a lot of threes. Um, yep, we're not getting post touches, but you know what? Our rebounding rate on missed threes is higher than missed twos. So if nothing else, longer rebound, shorter team, we're giving ourselves a chance. And so just kind of, you know, being okay to be different, as I'd say. And I know the second thing was, uh, what have I stolen? Uh, do you want me to pause first? You want to go there? Well, I want to know, what do you stole? I mean, we all steal. I, I'm really trying to hammer home, and I'm going to delete this and make it cleaner in the, in yeah. the edit, but Right. When you're a hammer, everything's a nail. So like yep. my soapbox is, hey, coach, what do I need to do to get better at basketball this spring? You need to play lacrosse. What? Yep. Right. And it's like, well, I don't want my guys out of season until the summer playing basketball, like play for fun, play pickup, get in a drill gym, do things. But like, go play another sport. Go learn to compete. Yep. Right. And so like my the, all of that coach to give the context of how can you shine a light on how valuable cross-disciplinary competition, mm -hmm. teaching, coaching, and learning is based on an example that you have stolen, that yep. you have implemented more right. than, hey, you got to do this. Because I just don't think as a coach, as a basketball coach originally, I'm at the Nike clinic. I'm at whatever. I'm watching college yeah. practices. Like at no point did I walk outside my classroom and watch the water polo team practice. Right. And now as the AD, the water polo team is right there. I watch them every day. And yeah. it's like, yeah, we're going in there. So yeah. that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> you know, talk about that makes me think of a, a great, actually a great example, a great story. Uh, it was, I was early in my coaching career. I don't know, year three, year four, something like that. And we were in a tournament, um, lost a heartbreaker in the first game, game we should have won. But going to the next game, like we knew that next day that we were going to win by 40, right? It's one of those, you just look at the two teams warming up and we were just a lot better. I'm just, it was what it was. Um, and the next day when we got in the gym, there was a player on that warming up for them that had not been there the day before. He was 6'5", he was thick, he was athletic, he was putting his elbow above the rim. And I had never seen that kid in film. I'd never heard about him or anything. I went up to their coach and said, hey coach, who in the world is that? And why is he here today? <laughs> you know, thinking, man, it's making it a lot tougher on us, which it did. But long and short of the story is this. He was a football player who was being recruited by Division I schools, like high level, like University of Texas, Oregon, like high level schools. And the day before, the University of Oregon staff had come on campus to visit him. And they asked him, they said, what sport are you playing this offseason? He's like, oh, I'm not playing another sport. I'm, I'm focused on my body. I'm, I'm going to run. I'm going to live. And they were like, no, 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 actually we don't want you to do that. <laughs> like if you want us to keep recruiting you, they literally told me, if you want us to keep recruiting you, go play basketball, go wrestle, go do something else um, to get some cross body movement and to, you know, just different experiences and different ways to build your athleticism. And that was so eye opening to me 
Um, you know, like I said earlier, I grew up playing multiple sports, but that was just because that's what everybody did back in the mid to late nineties. Um, but when I got to coaching, I was like, you know, basketball, basketball, basketball. And I get it. At some point, if you are projected as a high level player, you might not play all three sports every single year and your summers might only be basketball. Awesome. But the approach I took as a coach, Hold I on. Started, yeah, that's 3% of the yeah. athletics playing high school athletes and youth in the country. Yep. No, absolutely. Right. Such a small percentage. Um, and we just put all of our eggs into one basket. And, you know, I got, I finally just really, really changed my, my viewpoint and started telling my players, listen, go do something else. Like, I want you to be doing something, you know, don't sit on your butt, don't play video games all off season, all summer, um, but go do something else. Even the point where I wouldn't have like spring off season, um, two reasons. Number one, I wanted to do something different, run track, play baseball. Also, I wanted to level up as a coach by coaching a different sport, <laughs> like something I didn't know. Like I played baseball growing up, but I wasn't a baseball coach. And so I started coaching our school's middle school baseball team because, OK, you know, one of my favorite coach quotes is by John Wooden. And he said, we have not taught until they've learned. And so I was like, OK, how can I really help youth baseball players learn? And what I recognized was I'm learning how to be a better basketball coach. Um, how to relate the game, how to say it so simply that a kindergartner could understand it. You know, so many times we as coaches, I think we just make it too hard. We want to sound smart. We want to make it sound so difficult, so elaborate, um, but simple wins and just have to really, really strip everything else away. And I think that helps our players too. Um, number one, a different voice. I want them to hear the track coach's voice. I want them to go hear the baseball coach's voice. I was coach boys, right? Softball coach, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, even the point where, you know, in Texas, <laughs> I love the summer in Texas because High school coaches actually allowed to coach their own team, but I wouldn't. Um, I if whether it was our summer league, whether it was team camps, um, I would literally have somebody else coach because I wanted some, them to hear somebody else's voice. Um, if we got in a situation where I had to be on the bench, all I did was make sure everybody played. <laughs> right in the summer, I believe everybody should play. Everybody should have a chance to get better. But they were calling the offense and defense. They were calling timeouts. They were like just like experiment and figure it out. Right. I, I think the off season should be a time to have a little cross disciplinary action, right? Learn something else, other body movements. And number two, to experiment. You know, no one cares who wins summer league. No one cares who wins team camp. It's, it's nice that weekend you get the t-shirt or whatever it is, you get that social media post, but like long-term, does that really improve um, who you are? And, and just last thought, and this is where I encourage you as coaches that are watching this to really, really, really hammer home your athletes playing other sports. Um, I had a conversation with a, uh, with a doctor who was the Oklahoma city thunders doctor for a long time, team doctor. He's done the NBA draft combine for about 15 years now. And he told me recently that the aging of the body of our 18, 17, 19 year old, you know, male athletes. And I think it applies to females as well. Is he said they're old. <laughs> like the reason, because a lot of these guys have played nothing but basketball. And again, going to your point, this is not just 3%. This is like the 3% of the 3% coming out of high school. But we all do the same thing, right? So many high school players are only playing one sport. And he said, because it's the same movement, the same stops, the same starts, the same contact, the same impact. He said, Matt, I was looking at 19 year olds where some of their joints look like they were like 30, 32. And so now he's turned around to tell these NBA teams, <laughs> Like, eh, I'm not sure. And the number one reason was they only played one sport. Um, it wasn't anything else. And so I think, yeah, playing multiple sports for as long as possible is just so, so important for all of our athletes. Well, thank you for that. I don't have a lot to add. Uh, that's pretty much if I could put it in a box and, and spit it out, that's what it would be. So I appreciate that. I want to go back to something you said earlier about playing on the scout team for the college women's program working in marketing in the athletics department. Um, having got my start at the college level, I know what you're talking about with the women's scout team, but I want you to give a 30 second primer on what that is, how important that was as, a, as an opportunity that's maybe a little outside the box that people aren't aware of to both grow as a player, to grow as a coach, and how working in athletics in general exposed you to opportunities that prepared you for the work you're doing now because again yeah. i think people end up in tunnel vision because they're committed to do x and they forget about all the other variables that it seems like you were able to take advantage of yeah man, great question first of all i was the knucklehead who thought women's sports was at such a lower level than the men going into college like if i'm being completely transparent like the guy's game's tough 
win this game and eh, whatever it's like it's what they can do and i'll tell you the first time i got invited to go play the women's scout team which basically is six or seven of us guys would show up and we would run the opposing offense run the opposing defense or sometimes just give the girls run so the coaches could look at different combinations different groups of five without having to sacrifice who was playing for the opposition man D1 level women are better than a lot of other college guys. Like it's just, it's a fact. Um, and so the women's game was real. That was the first thing for me. And I'm so glad like they, they just ran up and down the floor on us that first game, right? They were more physical than we were. They were in better shape than we were. They were more athletic than we were. Um, and I mean, we were all 19, 20 years old, like the best shape we'd probably ever been in. And so that was the first thing that I learned. I was like, man, basketball is basketball. And just having respect for both gender side of the sport, for sure. Um, you know, at, when I was in college at ORU, the women went to, I think it was two out of four NCAA tournaments, um, had a, had a shot one time as a 16 seed to, they didn't almost knock off number one, but it was, it wasn't a 40 point drubbing, right? Like they, they kept it somewhat close. And so what I just realized was, man, a lot goes into it. And just seeing even the coaches on that side, like even thinking about like the scouting of the opponent and how intricate it was. Now I loved it because I was the lead guard on that team. So I always got to be their other best player and just like let it fly, um, which also opened up my eyes to how freeing that is as a player. Like I knew I wasn't getting subbed out if I missed a shot. <laughs> there were only seven of us. No, it's sub number one. But number two, it was like, man, it was such a different experience for me from high school. And I loved my high school coach. But if I missed a three, I'm already looking over at the sideline knowing I'm probably getting subbed before the defense even gets the rebound. And so like just getting back into the player's eyes side of things and getting that feel for how different things were, that was huge for me. Um, as I was working in marketing and, and communications, it made me also realize how important those things are to a program of success. And like when I'm on the, on, you know, coaches with their consulting calls and um, we can talk about later on, but you know, any coach who wants to sign up, like I love to do a free 30 minute meeting with any coach that wants to just talk about where are you at? How can I help you out in 30 minutes? What can I do for you? Uh, and one thing on a lot of these calls I'm saying is, Hey, what, what's your like social media look like for your team? And like, what? Oh, that's, that's way, way, way down the list. I'm like, actually it shouldn't be. Um, this we're in a social media world, good or bad, like it, don't like it. But I think one of the best things we can do for our players is allow them to feel loved and cared for and appreciated. And so when you have a, whether it's a team account or a personal account and you're tweeting out highlights or posting, man, love the way I saw our team bounce back, you know, using those things, players recognize that. Um, you know, I'm not one, like, I'm never going to go into a, another school and try to recruit someone's players away. But I'll also tell you, like, it's a lot harder environment to be successful when there's always this tension of coach versus player. And so if we can pick our spots with that and let social media be loved, like it was crazy. Like how many players would just flock to our program? We wouldn't go after them, but they would show up because, man, this school cares about their team, right? This school, like we're trying to help kids play in college by posting their stuff. We're, we're letting the community know when we're playing. And those were things that I, at the time I didn't even realize what I was learning. I just started to do them. And then realize what a separate was for our teams and our programs. <laughs> Love that. And um, it's something that as the athletic director, if you put your AD hat back on, you're threading the needle between uh, the locus of control and managing <laughs> multiple accounts. And, how, you know, how do you figure that out? But I know that our social media presence as a department has been really important in promoting um, the athletic program at the school in, in that way. And I also, uh, because you brought up the consulting call and I appreciate you putting that out there and we'll put the link in the show notes, but what have you learned most recently that you can share as a bullet list of sorts these are the number one, two, and three challenges that I hear about. These mm -hmm. are the one, two, and three low hangingest, if that's even a word, fruit okay. to solve said challenges <laughs> over, let's just say this season. I know you've been doing it for a couple of years. I know you've had like a foot in here and, and you're in a couple of different spaces, but the post COVID world is obviously a little different, but, yep, but yep. just let's say this season, what are like the one, the three or a handful of challenges and a handful of low hanging solutions you can provide? Absolutely. Um, I would say uh, one of the, one, the number one thing I hear all the time is, and I, you know, 
if we had all day, we could talk about the word culture and align on definition of that because that's such a you know hot topic word and whatever. I think that's just culture is just the way players feel while they're in their program and after they leave your program, right? To me, and um, that's something that I found like I'm going to say nearly every because I'm sure there's an exception somewhere, but nearly every coach feels like they're not doing well enough. And, you know, all the time I guess, hey, you know, I've got trying to get players to buy in. Again, another key word we use as coaches, you know, hot phrase, buy in, that I feel this. And here's what I tell coach. I was actually talking to a middle school coach just a couple of days ago. And I said, well, well, who have you gone after on the playing level to help you change the culture? And his answer was, well, the biggest knucklehead, basically. My word's not his, biggest knucklehead. And I think that's what I did at first. I don't know about you and your experience, but like, man, this is my biggest issue. If I could get this person to change, or maybe it's this parent or this whatever, but that's going to be really, really hard, you know? And I think sometimes too hard if we haven't done other things first. And so my answer to that question is pick the lowest hanging fruit. <laughs> like who is that next player, assistant coach, parent, whatever situation we're in, who's most likely to buy in? Right. And here's tell coach all the time. Like, okay, let's say I'm the only one as the culture keeper of the program. Maybe I have no assistance. I've been years where that's been the case, right? Whatever it is. I'm going to go find that one player who's most likely to get on board. So now once there's two of us, we both go find the next two lowest hanging piece of fruit. Two becomes four, right? Four becomes eight. All of a sudden before too long, that biggest knucklehead or that, that biggest adverse piece of the culture, they stand out as the outlier. Right. Like we can say positive peer pressure. We can put all these, you know, whatever. But really what it is, is if we want to define our culture, we have to get as many people on board as possible. And that's when the tide starts to shift. Right. Like you might you've got your early adapters, you got your late adapters, you got everything else. But like I'm going to go for the early adapters. Right. The people that help me, because now I want to set the foundation. It's hard to set the foundation with just one or two, especially if you're that second person you're trying to get is the most different from what you're currently trying to do. So I say that'd be one piece um, that, I, that we talked to coach about. Um, a second thing that I hear, actually, I was uh, visiting a D1 practice not too long ago and wasn't even there to consult, just there to watch, you know, friend of a friend situation. I'm sure you've done that a lot. And that night when I got home, my phone rang and it was the head coach of that division one men's program. And I answered, I said, man, hey coach, what's going on, man? So thank you so much for the watch. I learned some things today, saw some things you're doing. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt, what did you think? Like, was our practice effective today? Was it? And so going back to what you mentioned before, the imposter syndrome, everybody has it. You know, it doesn't matter if you're a fifth grade basketball coach or if you're division one head coach, like you are always second guessing yourself and you're always feeling like you're not enough. And you're all like, that's just that piece where we all go through it. Um, so number one, you're not alone. It's okay. Like to recognize it. And number two, the, what the, what I've always recommended coaches is man, that's, that's where going back to what we talked about earlier, like be in conversation with other coaches, right? Whether it's just coaches with more experience, regardless of sport, whether it's someone who does it, like whatever offense or defense you believe in, find coaches that run that offense or defense successfully and have for a while. Go talk to that coach, <laughs> ask them to watch film, ask them to break it down and do a little five minute voiceover of one of your team's games. Like those are things we all go through that feeling, right? None of us are alone in that. Um, but Hey, it's just attacking it. Right. And it was, it was amazing. Like then that conversation was like, man, thank you so much. And I was thinking, you know, on one level, my own imposter syndrome, like, dude, I've never coached the college level and you have for more than 20 years, <laughs> but we we're all looking for people we know. And, and even going back to that piece, like it might be somebody at a lower level than you that has what you're needing. Like, it's not all about levels. People like you and I, Justin, been in the coaching game longer from a, just a 10 year standpoint. We know that probably better than most. Some of the best coaches I've ever been around are middle school coaches. We still run an out-of-bounds yeah. play that one of my former coaches got from a fourth-grade rec league. Like, it shouldn't matter. Like, if it, if the stuff yeah. can help, it can help. Like, seek yeah. solutions. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, uh, just yeah, it's just really interesting. All levels, all coaches, both genders. Like, we all go through the same stuff. And so, like, there's there's a support system out there, I think, that sometimes we don't even realize. Okay. Let me wrap with this. Because you're getting touches on so many different spaces and challenging certain assumptions and beliefs, I like to ask, what is something you have most recently changed your mind on? I used to believe this, and now I'm over here, and here's why. Mm. It's good. 
you know, um, the younger me would be really frustrated with this response right now. But one thing I changed my mind on over my last couple of years of coaching was scouting is actually not that important. Um, I, I think that it comes to a place where, hey, let's just be great at what we do and stop being a chameleon like team that changes every Tuesday and every Friday based upon what the other team does. And if we spend more time focused on our things, like make them prepare for us versus prepare for them. I'm not saying as coaches, we shouldn't watch film. We should be prepared. But, you know, there are a lot of players, especially at the high school level or the college level, it doesn't matter, middle school level, anywhere in between, below the pro level, where our players actually don't maybe love the game as much as we do. It might, it might be providing a means to an end. Maybe all their friends play basketball. Maybe they're just good at it. Their parents make them play. Maybe it's paying for their college education. Like whatever, so many reasons. Um, and so I used to, even the high school level, give out these like four and five page scouting reports and it would be down to the T. Like I would know that would know, like one coach one time said to me, like, leave no stone unturned. Um, I'll never forget a couple of years ago, we were playing against a great team, the best team in our league. They had four guys that are playing power five. They had another one that's also playing D one. I mean, their sixth man was a six, eight shooter. <laughs> and it was like, man, they just had options all over the place. And I think when we played them, they were, they'd played 31 or 32 games before then. I don't know how California is. Texas plays a lot of games. Um, we were, I was coaching Oklahoma, but we still played in Texas league at the time. And I watched 28 of their 31 previous games on film. And I'm not saying some coaches, we shouldn't do that as coaches. Like I need to be prepared as the coach. But what it changed was years before, I would give them this huge scouting report, right? Every little thing. No, no, no. We actually had a one page scouting report. And that anything my players didn't know, if it didn't fit on one page, I was not allowed to give it to them. Um, I had other ideas and thoughts, but we we're in practice and we most focused on doing what's best for us. And we didn't win that game. I wish we could, we could have had a great story here about it, but we were up, but we had no division one players. Love my like great team. We had multiple guys that are playing at college level, but their talent was just a lot better than ours. We were leading with two minutes to go before halftime and we were doing everything we want to do because we were thinking about us. We weren't worried about them. Um, we were just going to be really excellent who we were and what we did. And so that's one thing that I've changed um, over my coaching career is like scouting reports. They're not the be all end all. Well, then you'll appreciate that I don't even do them. So um, there you go. We're, we're I haven't been able to fully let go, right? Like there's still a piece of me, but yeah, I love it. I just look at it and, and we can wrap with this unless you want to add something on. That time is our most valuable resource. And yeah. I work at a boarding school that is a prep, college prep school. These kids are yeah. overwhelmed. I got 90 minutes a day and like, where are we going to push our chips into the 20% that it's going to get us to 80% of the results, right? The Pareto yeah. principle. And it's like, yo, like you said, focusing on what we do, how do you hack the game and figure out a way to play that is going to give you the best opportunity game in game out. And you know, that that's what we try to do. And that's what it right. sounds like you've tried to figure out. Absolutely. I, I agree hundred percent. I mean, you beat me to it. Our athletes right now, especially the high school level have more stuff pulling on them than ever before. Mm -hmm. And so much stress, you know, I, at the time I was at a college prep school as well. It was like between the homework they go home with, the stress with their parents and their, you know, boyfriends or girlfriends or what, like there's so many things. And just because basketball is always my number one priority doesn't mean it's theirs in that moment, in that day. Um, and so like, man, freeing them of that. Um, yeah. And I'd say one of the things that I changed that would love to hear your thoughts on this one is my best player doesn't actually need to initiate my offense. Um, that's one thing that I went away from. I'm not saying they can't initiate our offense, but I think a lot of times we might have one best player and the ball is always in their hands. And so we look for a lot of ways to do other things. Like one of my favorite things to do was get some of our bigs to initiate the offense with dribble handoffs, mm -hmm. because typically that big defender is not going to come out and guard the three point line. Yeah. And so we were actually turning into a ball screen situation, right? There's no real difference. Just yeah. one person, the screener has the ball versus the person using the screen having the ball. Yeah. And it does two things. Number one, it makes us a little bit different and we can create some earlier advantages, I think, in our offense, because no matter what offense we run, it's all about creating advantages. Mm -hmm. And then number two, we had players who felt more involved than they would otherwise. Right. Um, again, my style of coaching, post players don't touch it a lot. Um, we like to play up and down the floor. We like to shoot a lot of threes. We like to get to the rim and drive. Now that they're not important, um, we would intentionally give them touches a couple of times a game so they feel involved. But hey, mm -hmm. like, I think a great example is Montrez Harrell when he played for the Wizards. Like, he initiated their offense, kind of like Draymond Green with the Warriors. Like he initiated their offense more than Bradley Beal did. Mm -hmm. But 
who's getting more shots, Bradley Beal, right? Russell mm-hmm. Westbrook, he was there, Kyle Kuzma, whatever else. But they would use Montrezl Harrell to do tons of ball screen actions or dribble handoff actions. And so, yeah, that's where I kind of changed. Like, we don't need our best player to initiate our offense. Mm-hmm. Um, they need to be making the most decisions. But let's, let's let somebody else have a chance to initiate. Yeah, no doubt. I think there's a lot of different ways to do that. And one of my buddies, we play a similar style where it's spread, dribble, drive type transition. Yep. And um, his deal was every time that he called a play, it was going to the big man. You know, mm-hmm. and he didn't call a whole lot of plays, but it was right. like when he did, that's who's getting the touch. Yeah. And I like the fact that you're trying to get them involved and love the fact that you're always trying to find a better solution. So appreciate yep. you taking the time, coach. Um, I really do. This will be fun. And uh, looking forward to uh, talking to you soon. Maybe seeing you Absolutely. this summer. Yeah, I love it. Thanks for letting me uh, be on and hang out. It was a lot of fun today.